confirm this is the the Twitter handle is rhta16, so you can go to that and ask questions. Uh, we do have a GitHub, so this is the link. It was included in the uh, email that we sent to all the participants um, today or yesterday. So this is where you can access all the code. There is a binder, which is an ability, is a functionality where you can run this code remotely. Uh, unfortunately, this has limited capacity, so we're asking you please to wait until after the meeting if you want to try that. So during the meeting, if you want to run code, please download it locally and run it on your own machines. So the program for today is uh, quite packed with really interesting looking presentations. And then we have a further um, set of talks on Monday morning. But for today, we're going to be starting with, unfortunately, we've missed out the speaker. But anyway, we've got a very full program. And um, for today, and we'll be closing at around 16.30. Just hold on one second. Our first little message of the day. So our first speaker is going to be Joe Moss. And the speaker is what, the way this is going to work is that we're going to make you temporarily co-hosts of the meeting. So that'll give you access to speaking and video, and you'll be able to share your screen. Uh, please don't get up to any mischief while you're the co-host of our meeting and uh, we'll take the privilege away at the end of the meeting. So Gianluca, do you want to make any more comments or should we go straight to Joe Moss if, he, if, you're, if he's there? I think we are probably in a position where most people have actually joined who should have. We, I can see in the list we have 162 participants right now which is awesome. And I wish to thank you, every single one of you uh, for this. And I think maybe uh, it's a good time to make a start. Okay, I'll stop sharing. And Joe Moss, if you want to take over, once Gianluca gives you access. Okay, Joe, I think I've just made you a co-host. So now you can take over and uh, share your screen. Uh, ho hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Right. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Uh, I can't share a screen, but I can share the PowerPoint by the looks of it. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Joe Moss. I'm a statistician at YHEC. Uh, so I'm predominantly involved in using R for statistics more than anything. Um, oh, Howard, someone's trying to get into the room. Are you able to deal with that? Or am I going to have to admit latecomers? Um, sorry uh, about that. Uh, yeah, so I predominantly use R for statistical analysis when it comes to health economic assessments, but occasionally I'm asked to help out with any sort of cost effectiveness analysis, especially if it's going to evolve any level of R coding. Um, and that's, that's where a patient level simulation will really have some advantages. So today's presentation is hopefully going to be a bit on about giving some introductory steps into how you would go about conducting a patient level simulation in R and why you would do something like that. And then hopefully you won't have to listen to me talk for the entire 20 minutes and we can have a demonstration of a patient level simulation model uh, at the end of the talk. So just for those unfamiliar with a patient level simulation, what is a patient level simulation? Well, unlike traditional cost effectiveness models that such as the Markov models or decision tree models, they tend to look at cohorts and they use cohort averages to decide or to determine total costs and benefits for, for, for a particular intervention. A patient level simulation, on the other hand, uses a random selection of patients and follows each one individually. So each individual patient will have their own unique pathway experience from treatment initiation all the way to the end of your model time horizon. And then to derive the actual estimates for costs and benefits at the end, you take the average of all the individual patients that have been through your model. So instead of looking at cohorts and using cohort averages, you're able to model individual patients. 
So the question is, why would you want to then do that patient level simulation? Well, the main advantage of a patient level simulation is the ability to um, track uh, and follow and record the individual histories of a patient. So if a specific event is going to cause further downstream implications of said events, such as um, a, a treatment related adverse event will cause quality changes, it might cause um, treatment discontinuation, it might cause patients to switch treatments altogether in sort of a, a, a sequence of treatments. That can all be incorporated and followed within a patient level simulation. It also allows you to model all sorts of things like nonlinear relationships between patient characteristics and their outputs. And I, I don't always agree with this statement because it depends how complicated you make your patient level simulation. Uh, but sometimes they are more intuitive and can be more flexible than typical cohort models. However, the main drawback of any patient level simulation is they obviously require more computational power to, to track any individual patient. But patient level simulations, they're growing in popularity and the NICE decision support unit does have documentation out there outlining what should and shouldn't be done in a patient level simulation as well as providing plenty of examples. And the, the main conclusion of the decision support unit is that a patient level simulation will suit some disease areas better than a cohort model can. Uh, these are disease areas such as ophthalmology where you've got each patient, each patient has two eyes um, and you could have sort of age related uh, macular degeneration in that but the degeneration is going to be different uh, occurring at different rates in different eyes uh, for each patient uh, and depending on your vision score you'll have further downstream effects from that and this disease area has been critiqued by ERGs and NICE in the past that cohort models aren't capturing this disease area sufficiently and therefore a patient level simulation is far better in this situation. So that's the uh, what and why, uh, there's always the how. Um, as I stated before, decision trees and state transition models, they're typically cohort based models but they are completely compatible with patient level simulations. You've just got to make sure that the decision tree probabilities are unique for each patient and there's a probability that each patient will experience a certain transition within a state transition model. Uh, the most common form of a patient level simulation uh, is a discrete event simulation, which uses time to event data to model and sequence events in a particular order. Um, and then schedule them and come up with your custom qualities that way. But all these approaches, they all use a sequence of events to determine the patient pathway. They all use random probabilities to determine when patients will experience these events. And they all follow individual patients across time. So just before I go on to showing some code for today, um, just so you can try and understand the basic principle of the model that I'm going to be talking through. It's based on chronic kidney disease and there are five possible therapies uh, and they're all designed to try and delay uh, the eventual start of dialysis because it's a chronic disease. It's a decision tree based uh, patient level simulation. So an event will occur and there's a random number draw to determine what will happen to that patient. Uh, I will also note that it is completely fictional, so I apologize if there's any CKD experts out there uh, and the biology is off. Um, it is just a hypothetical model for an example today. So what sort of happens in the model is that you have a, the start of the cycle. The model will determine whether the patient is on treatment or not based on your model setup. And based on that, it will update the number of injections that a patient's meant to receive from a statistical draw, update the, what's known as the glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of chronic kidney disease. So if they're on, uh, the model will check, is the person on treatment? If they are, they get the treatment effect. If they're not on treatment, then they'll decline uh, in this rate because it's a chronic disease. 
whether they pass the threshold of treat, uh, dialysis start and whether they experience any treatment related adverse events and all these things have an impact on costs and then qualities and then the final check is did the patient die and if they did yes you stop simulating for that person and move on to the next if not you move on to the next cycle in your model until the time horizon has been achieved so to try and make it as easy as possible to to come up with designing a patient level simulation it can often be daunting when you're first approached to ask to design a patient level simulation especially if you've not done one before but i try to use these six sort of easy steps to try and allow me to um, design and store my code in such a way that it should follow this pattern so the first thing you need to do in any patient level simulation is simulate the patient characteristics that you're going to model. You then need to code a series of functions that are gonna take each of those patient characteristics and model them over time, to see what happens with your random number draws and statistical distributions. You then need to loop that over every single patient you want to do for the size of your cohort. You then want to condense the results because you're going to end up with a lot of data produced in this step. And if you're going to try and analyze the outcomes, you don't want to be calling a lot of data over and over again. It does tend to slow down any code you're working on. And finally, the most important step in any patient level simulation is the actual uh, stability checks to make sure that your simulation is producing redu reduce reproducible results. Sorry. So if we sort of go through those steps now, so in terms of patient numbers and patient characteristics, determining how many patients you're going to simulate in your co hypothetical cohort is a challenge, really. It, it's, it's a balance between computational time required to simulate those patients, depending on the complexity of your patient level simulation, as well as the actual stability of the model. So. For example, it, your 10,000th patient in your simulation is going to have such a bigger impact than the millionth patient. Um, but the differences that you could achieve by going up to the millionth patient could be minute. It might not be worth that additional computational time to simulate that many patients. So it, it is a careful balancing act. One way, uh, and, and recommended by the NICE Decision Support Unit document I referenced before, one way to try and reduce the number of patients that you need to simulate and, and therefore speed up your simulation is to generate your hypothetical cohort with outside of your main simulation. So generate your pool of patients first, so therefore you can run the same patient through each arm of your trial, uh, each arm of your model, so your intervention and comparative. So the same patient one runs through both arms, uh, and this prevents you having to just rely on randomness that the same patient one in say the intervention arm might have different characteristics than patient one in the comparator arm if you just randomly sample them so you're going to have to sample and generate more patients just to hope you end up with patients that are similar across cohorts but by simulating them outside the main simulation you can vastly reduce the amount of patients you need to simulate and to simulate the characteristics I tend to use the trial-based summary data. It could be literature. It could be from uh, individual patient data if you've got it available. And their characteristics can be simulated independently or dependently, depending on if you have regression analysis that link things, so such as age might be highly correlated with uh, another characteristic of your patient. So you want to try going to want to keep that relationship within your population as well. So it, it matches clinical plausibility. Then once you've got your characteristics, you just need to loop them and store them uh, for the cohort size. So uh, yes, here we go. So if we just move on to the code now, just to uh, give you an example of what's going on, I'll go into a bit more detail later when we go through the actual run through. But this is just a function here that is taking all the model inputs that are defined, whether that be through a script or through an shiny interface and the characteristics age gender uh, the baseline glomerular filtration rate uh, and the function takes all of these uh, 
characteristics and stores them in a temporary list. And I'm sure people are used to seeing these functions here. So you've just got uh, pulling age from a normal distribution. You can sample things, so such as if you had a coder from an NMA output that looked at your treatment effects, you could sample a particular row of that coder to try and capture that. Uh, you could use other distributions to match other characteristics. So in this case, I've got a gamma distribution for the number of injections that patients will receive. And you could even start trying to build in some second order uh, variability into, into your patient characteristics here. So such as that I had a regression that looked at mapping uh, filtration rate to quality of life. And I've used a Cholsky matrix from that to generate individual random coefficients for the regression that maps it for each individual patient. So you're starting to build in second order uh, variability here as well. Uh, and then obviously the outputs are there listed as a, as a list. And you can see that this would be repeated for each individual patient. And then you can draw from this list in your patient level simulation. So once you've defined your hypothetical cohort, uh, you then need to start designing uh, functions that will be able to map individual patients over time uh, through a series of functions. And these can be as complicated as your pathway needs to be. They can interact with each other. In this case, there's very little interaction in today's example, but um, the, the only limit is your imagination to how well you can actually program the pa patient pathway, but obviously the more complex functions you put in, the slower your simulation will be. So you can do things such as just a, a standard loop here that's just doing if checks to determine is the patient on treatment? Yes, well, they're going to receive the treatment effect and the filtration rate increases. And then once they stop treatment and the natural decline happens, uh, but you can have several things that then this function will then feed into another and another and another. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think I can easily switch to R at this point. So I'll, I'll circle back around to this to try and show what I mean. But once you've got your, all your individual functions that take certain patient characteristics uh, and map them to outcomes, it's always useful to then wrap them into an individual function that we can then loop over patients uh, for the entire cohort. Now, I won't spend too long looking at this in particular parallel computing because I know it's another topic of today's uh, session, but the parallel computing does have a big impact here in terms of the actual speed at which your simulation can run at. That's simply because typically or, or by standard, R will only use one core of your processor to perform its functions. But by using packages such as do snow or for each, you can force R to separate out its calculations over multiple clusters. So you can take advantage of the fact that modern computers have multiple cores in their computer. So you can get R to do it multiple times. So in, for my computer, for example, I have four cores. I set it so it only uses three of them. So hopefully Zoom won't crash when I'm doing the run through. There's a little bit of my computer left to host Zoom. Um, but then that means that there are three possible cores for R to do its calculations on instead of uh, just a single one. So it does speed up speed in that point. So to set up parallel computing, you just need to make what is known as these clusters, which can be done for this code here using the base package parallel. And then once you've set up your clusters, you can then use a function called for each um, to pass information to each of these clusters to then do some parallel computing. So if I just go into this a little bit. So the for each here, this, this first, bracket section, we are passing information to each of the clusters. Because the clusters copy and paste information from the global environment into each of these clusters and runs them individually, you need to make sure that you're doing things such as telling it which packages you have functions that require to be loaded in these other clusters. Otherwise, um, 
it, you'll just get error messages saying cannot find function X. Um, 